I will uh, quickly in a compact manner in the next 12 minutes uh, speak on glenoid fractures. So <clears throat> today's agenda would be to cover classification, understand which ones to operate. We'll give you the option that there is a conservative option, arthroscopy, open reduction. Most importantly, I'd like to dwell on the importance of imaging that is very critical. A brief about approaches and a couple of examples after that. So um, number of classifications and I'm not too happy because everything doesn't fit into a perfect classification. Often one has uh, patients who have such complex fractures that they don't fit into any particular classification. The Eidberg classification was predominantly described for scapular fractures but has been extrapolated to glenoid fractures. And then here you have the old OTA classification on the bottom right here, where a very simplified version as extra articular scapula or inferior articular glenoid and entire glenoid is too simplified. However, because it is popular, we continue to refer to the Eidberg classification and uh, there's a fair bit of unanimity between all of us. I particularly appreciate this classification, which is the AOOTA classification, which was described in JSES in 2012 and very simply describes glenoid fractures very specifically, apart from scapula, as to the infra-equatorial, uh, trans-equatorial and both pillar affections. On the right side, you have these comminuted versions and here you have these. These are very common associations where you have these Eidberg two, where there is a transverse fracture across the glenoid, a superior inferior fragment, whether it's low, middle, and superior. So that is this usually is my preference. Now, right. this is a patient who has a, a bony bank art. Now I understand the threshold between a bony bank art and a fracture anterior column glenoid is very fine, but I'd rather like to look at them as intra-articular fractures and this is because she's 65, the x-rays look very innocent. But if you look very closely here, you will realize that uh, on this x-ray here, you can see a fragment here. Please take that seriously because the x-ray is fairly naive. But when you look into the CT, you realize it's fairly big. In an elderly patient, because the bones are osteoporotic, it is more likely to be an osteoporotic fracture. And if it is stable, like this lady here, I have managed that conservatively with a good result within two and a half to three months. So there is a role provided you monitor these fractures on a regular basis. This is an interesting paper by Spiegel et al. Um, in 2013, where they had 12 patients who had a very smaller fragments, less than 5%, and they conserved most of them. And I think three out of those 12, almost one fourth had instability and needed surgery. Amongst the other 13 patients who had a larger fragment, average fragment size was 15, you would realize that almost excellent result in 54 with surgery, but uh, and moderate results in 15, poor result only one. So surgery can be useful in larger fragments, but do be careful, even the smaller fragments, which are on the average 2%, had 25% chances of instability. When you're dealing with a bony bank art, my inclination is always to do arthroscopic because my core training is arthroscopy. But apart from the bony bank arts, even the type 2 Eidbergs, I would prefer to treat arthroscopically. But each one is different. The bony bank arts, I prefer to treat with a double row approach. And uh, this one is a elderly patient, uh, almost 60, there are, and you would see that this x-ray clearly shows a fracture here going from the trans glenoid entering into the scapula. X-ray looks doable. Honestly, you could treat him quietly, but the CT scan reveals fracture lines moving all across. When you have a fracture line across the scapular body and involving intra-articular, then one needs to take it seriously. This fellow is a professional golfer, although he's 61 years old, and uh, we are offered him both the options and he chose the surgery option. 
Uh, this is the fracture that uh, Miguel uh, referred to in the previous question about the type 2. Now, this looks reasonably easy and uh, simple to do, but this is the Nevisor portal and this is arthroscopically fixed from top to bottom. And uh, he's gone back to his, he's the national golf player. And you can see arthroscopically the fracture is highlighted much better here. And look at this post reduction x ray, it is almost perfectly reduced. So, younger patients, I would offer them an arthroscopy. Don't rely on the x rays to give you an innocent approach. The 3D CT scan will give you a much better understanding of the quality of the fracture. And then you can use a probe from the posterior lateral portal to help your uh, reduction. And then use a cannulated guide wire and pass in a single screw from top to bottom through the Nevisor portal. As far as the bony bank art is concerned, uh, the standard bank art surgery techniques uh, that was described by Juan Patino may not apply because these are big fragments and they need a very special approach to treat. I will fast forward this video in your interest. What I prefer to do is to insert one anchor very medial with which is double loaded four sutures pull those sutures underneath that fragment medially and then pass in two more anchors which are single loaded on the edge of the fracture line so here you don't need to pass any suture passer all you need to tie is the medial to the lateral row this is a double row technique that i prefer to and when you see you tie the medial sutures to the lateral sutures in a crisscross manner so the top ones go inferior, the bottom ones go superior. And as you tighten them, the whole construct will get reduced, compressed into a hairline reduction. It is very important to ensure that the fragment doesn't tilt. With a single row, it is very common for that fracture fragment to tilt inside the glenoid and spoil the articulation as such. So this is my preferred technique on these patients. Mm. Go to the next. Right. So this is a patient. Uh, he was operated with a bank card elsewhere in 2019. Had a uh, 17. Sorry. Two years later, had a slip and fall. He's young, 27 years old. Has had three dislocations after that. When a patient has suture anchors inside and he re-dislocates, it's very common to have a bony frag of uh, bony bank card because of the fatigue fracture at the fracture site. So again, x-rays look fairly innocent. On the actual x-ray uh, CT scan, you'd see a small fragment, but it is the 3D CT scan, sagittal reconstruction with subtracting the humeral head. That is the instruction I give to my radiologist. And you can see it's a substantial fragment, not something that should should ignore. So be careful, the x-rays can be fairly innocent. And these are his previous sutures with, which we had to remove in advance and then mobilize this fragment and ensure that we prepared it very well. You can see some cartilage changes there significantly. But here, you have to prepare the bony fragment very well. And here you will see that I have released the labrum in such a manner. We'll do a shift. And all that here is the bony fragment just at the bottom. And that's the entire bony fragment here. You can see that. And then this is the final repair with the double row technique that I just described. And you will see at the end that not only is the IGHL very strong and taut, but you've got a good bumper and you've got sutures passing across from the medial to the lateral. It's frightening to have the medial anchor and you need a special subscap portal for that. But I shall detail on that in the next few slides. So this is another lady who's had a bony bank art, elderly lady, very unstable, would dislocate every time she abducted her arm. And this is her construct between the medial anchor and the lateral anchor. You don't need to use any suture passer on these patients. Another patient, double row, bony bank card. You can see that the entire bony fragment has been brought in level, flush with the parent bone and a hairline reduction on these. And this is how they will look. These are orthocords. So most of these will, 60% of this will dissolve over time. So even the sutures are bioabsorbable along with the anchor so that they will not cause a hindrance intraarticularly. It is important and I always do a repeat CT scan between three and six months post-op to see and confirm that the entire fragment has been uniformly integrated because this fragment is rendered avascular and in some patients it will dissolve eventually and if it dissolves it leads to a bone loss 
and that is why the purpose of getting the CT scan done. In the previous days, we used to use metal anchors, so 5 mm anchor medially and 2.8 anchors laterally, and that's how the construct will look on an X ray. Now we use the bioabsorbable anchors, so we can't see them on the post op X ray. The point I was trying to make is the medial portal in these patients has to be very medial, and that's why it skirts along the brachial plexus. So we always expose the axial nerve, ensure our cannula, long cannula, is away from the axial nerve, because the first two cases that I did had a lot of tingling numbness in the axillary nerve and the radial nerve, which lasted for almost two to three months. So you have to be very careful with the medial portal. So this is another patient that we're talking about, 39 years old, had a bad road traffic accident, right shoulder was with a drop arm. Clinically, he had a complete drop arm, no strength, and it was peculiar. And the x-rays, if you look, looked like a GT fracture, but there was something happening here. And if you look very closely, you'll see that there's a funny appearance because there's a break in the cortex here. If you look here, you'll think this is fairly innocent and doesn't reveal the same depth. If you look at the CT scan, a 2D CT scan is inadequate to give us the extent and gravity of the situation. And this is the sectional CT scan at the lower level, just shows a GT fracture. At a higher level, you see a nice bony bank out there coming. Again, underwhelming. Again, it looks fairly naive and innocent. And if you look here, this is the fragment here. And then until you do a 3D CT scan, you can see how big that fragment is. So this is a very big fragment. It is displaced, always rely on the 3D. And now we have a double problem here, a GT fracture and a displaced glenoid fracture. So you've done an arthroscopic fixation of the glenoid fracture. At the same time, we've done a uh, double row uh, suture fixation for the row GT fracture along with. This is another patient who's 55 years old and you can see this is a much more grievous injury. This is a type 3 where the fracture line is going medially but there's a lot of combination on the glenoid side and the fragment this time is posterior. So this is much more stressful than the previous. This is of course done open. Oh, so so modified Jude approach. We've done a plating. So this is a T-plate posteriorly. Anteriorly, we've done the suture fixation. You can see a coracoid ostrotomy here to allow me to get a better view on this fixation. This is another patient who is an acromial fracture in combination with his comminuted GT fracture. <clears throat> we've got suture anchors combined with a screw fixation for his glenoid along with the acromion. Again, an open technique. Uh, when I go posteriorly, uh, I use a modified Jude, like Ram described, you go in the internervous plane between teres minor and infraspinatus. Very rarely do I have to take down the deltoid. My preference is again to keep the deltoid intact. And for glenoid fractures, you can use nice retractors to help evaluate these. This one is again a type three that's extending into the scapular column. So use a, just a two hole reconstruction plate along with the screw to fix the acromion, which is a simultaneous approach. This one is a much more significant injury here. And you can see that there are several components of the scapula that are damaged. You've got the glenoid involved, and then you've got a posterior column involved, and you've got a clavicle fracture in addition. So if you had to use three different approaches, the nevisor to fix that superior and inferior glenoid fragment first, then we went to do the clavicle fracture, and the last was a posterior approach to fix the scapular column. And here we've got this X-ray done after eight weeks. It's healed nicely. This is a young guy. So the, the true AP and the outlet X-rays will explain uh, that the fracture fixation has been satisfactory. The entire column has been reconstructed. But these are tedious fractures, take a long time and planning. So it is important to decide. I do them in the beach chair position to facilitate all, all three approaches simultaneously so that I don't like to change the patient position once it is draped. So in conclusion, I think uh, displacement of more than 5 mm is significant because these are intra-articular fractures. Please, whenever you suspect any form of glenoid fracture, go and do a 3D CT because the X-ray will miss everything. You might need multiple approaches when there's an anterior and posterior column approach. My preference would be the larger fragment. So usually go posterior, fix that up, and then come in anteriorly and do the anterior fixation on these patients. If it's the Eidberg 2, or 
Eichberg 3 or a bony Bankard large, I would always prefer an arthroscopic. But even if you do an open, it doesn't matter because the results are pretty similar as long as you reduce the articular fragments anatomically. Any fracture that is six weeks old in my hands is bad news because it has malunited and it's very difficult for me to put them back into the original position. Thank you very much for your attention.